my name is Stefania Maggi. I'm the coordinator of the Child Studies Program. And I'm very pleased to welcome you to the Child Studies Lecture Series for the year 2012 and 2013. Before I introduce you to our tonight's speaker, um, I would like to just say a few words about this series, this lecture series. The Child Studies Program is launching a brand new curriculum in the fall of 2013. And the vision of the new program is to train students in the interdisciplinary field of child studies and to contribute to the creation of an emerging workforce of individuals whose professional aspiration is the promotion of children and youth well-being through advocacy, policy, research, and practice. In simpler words, what this means is that our vision is to train students to become game changers and active players in the support and promotion of the well-being of children. The lecture series has been organized to facilitate dialogue between researchers, community members, and students on a series of topics that are of relevance for children and youth in Canada today. The first presentation took place in October. I was one of the speakers, actually I was the speaker. Very few people came, but don't worry about it, I don't take it personally. <laughs> Probably many of you didn't know about it because they really tried hard to hide the advertisement <laughs> so that nobody would come. But I'm very glad that I have the opportunity to tell you a little bit about the future speakers that we have lined up for this year that will follow tonight's presentation. We have three more talks between January and March, so one per month. And the topics we have lined up are food uh, preferences for uh, of autistic children. We have a presentation about uh, the politics of beauty and pageantry in uh, children. And we have a presentation about ethical issues in developmental neuroscience. So I uh, invite you, everyone, to attend these lectures. They're public, they're free, and as I said, it'd be great to see you there. Tonight we're very fortunate to have Professor Clad Hertzman present for us. And I'm very pleased that I have the opportunity to introduce you <laughs> to him. Dr. Hertzman is the director of the Human Early Learning Partnership. He's a Canada Research Chair in Population Health and Human Development. He's professor in the School of uh, Population Public Health at UBC. And he's a fellow of the Experience-Based Brain and Biological Development and Program and the successful societies programs of the Canadian Institute for Advanced Research. He's also a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada and the Canadian Academy of Health Sciences. Okay, so this is all his public, you know, bio. <laughs> that's what's out there. Uh, well, tonight I'm gonna tell you something that's not yet on his website. And I had the honor to publicly announce that Professor Hertzman, Clyde, has been awarded the 2012 Pickering Award for Contributions to Developmental Psychology in Canada. So he's here tonight also to receive this award. Thank you. <laughs> the award is given annually by the Pickering Center for Research and Human Development to individuals who have demonstrated a lifelong career of excellence in mentorship, leadership, and scholarship in a field related to developmental psychology. Well, there is no question that CLED exceeds all this criteria in my mind. CLED has shown exemplary leadership in the field of developmental psychology, epigenetic, community engagement, knowledge mobilization, and more recently in his career in the field of human rights. Throughout his career, CLED has played a central role in creating a framework that links population health to human development emphasizing the special role of early childhood development as a determinant of health. His research has provided a wide range of scientific evidence to support the idea that what happens in the early years, during you know, the, the early years, is very important to lifelong health and well-being. His research findings have helped shape policy, community programs, locally, provincially, nationally, and also internationally. In the year 2000, Clyde founded the Human Early Learning Partnership, which he has directed since. Now HELP has developed into a collaborative, multidisciplinary research network of 
200 and plus faculty members, researchers, and students from uh, six British Columbia universities, which I think they're all BC universities. Pretty much, yeah. And his leadership role with HELP has been recognized not only nationally, but also internationally. Back in 2005, when the WHO, the World Health Organization, established the Commission on the Social Determinants of Health, Clad was chosen as the leader for the Knowledge Hub in Early Child Development. The work done by the Commission has had a tremendous impact on international community and has helped identify and create common language and a framework of reference for initiatives promoting the well-being of children around the globe. Through his career, Clyde has also served as a faculty supervisor to dozens of students and postdoctoral fellows, and on many other students' advisory committees. Well, in fact, that's how I got to know Clyde. <laughs> it was the year 2000, at the early times of the Human Early Learning Partnership, and I was in my first year PhD at UBC. And I remember taking part in meetings, and but now, Thinking back, I really consider these meetings quite revolutionary, personally, professionally speaking. At those meetings, I saw my first map, <laughs> a map of Vancouver mainland. It was subdivided in subdivisions and neighborhoods with varying shades of brown. You know, those different shades of brown represented different proportions of children who were in kindergarten and who had shown some vulnerabilities in their development. But on the map, there were also red and blue dots. These dots indicated those schools where children actually did better than expected, given the challenges they were facing in their, in their neighborhoods, while the other dots showed children who did not well as expected. Well, little I knew that these dots actually made the core of my research <laughs> <laughs> today. Fast forwarding 2012, we know now that those maps played a tremendous role in promoting the importance of the early years and understanding the social determinants of the early years and also understanding early child development as a determinant itself of health throughout the life course. So let's go back for a moment to those meetings. There I was, listening to Clyde. He speaks at a lightning speed. You probably heard him talk. I tried to make sense to the far-reaching scope of these thoughts. They were all over the place. And he kept naming names of people and organizations that I really had no idea <laughs> who they were, They're, what kind of role they played in society. So I was very much uh, engaged in the process of these meetings. And I, what I was getting out of that was a lot of uh, uh, enthusiasm that was quite contagious at the time. For me to fully understand what was happening at the moment really was a, an incredible effort. Well, I was a recent immigrant to Canada. It was my first year PhD, and I was pregnant. So if you have been pregnant and in school at the same time, you know what I'm talking about. So it was very reassuring when Clyde explained to me that women's IQ would decrease during pregnancy, <laughs> but I would gain my brains back with my, the birth of my son, which I'm <laughs> glad it happened. <laughs> Clyde has been a tremendous mentor for me <laughs> at all stages in my career. He has several qualities, but generosity is perhaps his greatest one when it comes to mentoring. Clad has been generous with his knowledge, his resources, his networks, his vision, and his wisdom. I learned an incredibly amount of, of things, of concepts, of experiences, just by observing him, interacting with different people, uh, being engaged in different projects. Much of what I know and I do today is actually been greatly influenced by, by Clyde, who you know, Clyde as a professional, as an accomplished professional, but also as a, as a great human being. So Rob Copeland, director of the Pickering Center for Human Development, do you mind joining me and 
awarding Clyde with the Pickering Award. Yeah. Thank you very much. Maybe you can open that later. And yes, thank you. Ah, <laughs> uh, yes. <laughs> <There's the laughs> what we're supposed to like do yeah, this? That's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. Right. Mm, that was lovely. Yeah. Thank you very much. Good, good. That's great. Yeah. Well, now I have to now I have to earn the uh, the plaudits. God, yes, which is the hard part. Um, first off, it's really great to be here. Um, what a generous introduction that was. Um, the work that I'm going to talk about tonight uh, actually is work that that Stefani was actually part of when it when it first started. Um, before she came back here to, uh, to Ottawa to seek her fortune. But, um, yeah, what is it? It's about quarter after six. So I'm going to try in about 45 minutes to tie a number of ideas together about thinking about early child development, child protection, and, and human rights. Um, and hopefully, this will be worthy of that wonderful introduction. Anyway, this basically has two if you'd like, legs to it. One leg is the Convention on the Rights of the Child. And I know that Ottawa is a hotbed of knowledge about the Convention on the Rights of the Child. Landon Pearson's here, the center's here, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm going to assume a fair amount of knowledge about the treaty as it is. But the other stool is the thing that Stefania talked about, which is the uh, WHO Commission on the Social Determinants of Health final report, whose chapter number five was called Equity from the Start. And the Equity from the Start chapter was the chapter that our Global Knowledge Hub, that Stefania was part of, produced about the role of early child development as being a lifelong determinant of health, well-being, learning, and behavior. As we were producing uh, this chapter, one of the things that we got interested in was how could you, in fact, promote a global conversation on the importance of the early years. You know, it wasn't central necessarily to the kind of work that the WHO already did, or UNICEF, or, or, uh, or UNESCO did necessarily. UNESCO was interested in education. WHO was interested in health, but most of what they were dealing with was nutrition, immunization, and things like that. Who was worrying about social and emotional development? Who was worrying about physical and language and cognitive development in a broader sense? And that was when the fact was brought to my attention as a physician epidemiologist who's way outside of the rights world, that in fact 193 countries in the world had signed up to the Convention on the Rights of the Child. And so there was a vehicle. Moreover, there was a monitoring process for that. So the opportunity and the thought that somehow or another, if we could migrate a conversation of the importance of the early years into the rights world, we might be able to do double duty. And part of the reason I was encouraged by that was because of the work of Will Kimlicka, who is a political philosopher at Queen's University just down the road from here. And when he was asked a few years ago about how Canada went from being one of the world's most racist countries to one of the world's most multicultural countries, his argument was that one way or another, largely by accident, multiple routes were opened up whereby language and culture minorities, Aboriginal people, and new immigrants could advance claims on Canadian societies. So the key idea was the multiple routes. That's what I heard. And I thought to myself, you know, we get a certain distance looking at early child development from the standpoint of educational equity, and a certain distance looking at it from the standpoint of public health. But this rights world is a world that exists almost outside of those worlds. And so if it's true that you can make progress in an agenda by opening up multiple routes to advance claims, what about the rights world as a way to advance claims? And so the rationale then was you know, to build on the monitoring capacity of the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child to orchestrate an improved global conversation on supporting children basically from the start. You know, and on the, um, the determinants of health side, obviously, the big issue is this, that in the early years, you have the densest network of sensitive periods in brain and biological development uh, that ever occur throughout life, and that these things are foundational for things that occur later on, and that by sensitive periods in brain and biological development, we mean periods in which we are sensitive to the conditions of stimulation, support, nurturance, and participation under which you are growing up. Moreover, if you dig into the convention, it does talk about states, parties, and others 
having uh, our duty bearers to provide opportunities for children's evolving capacities. And these, I would argue, are evolving capacities. So there is a bridge potentially there. Moreover, the era internationally has really changed. One of the struggles that has existed, and it's one of these stupid things, but it's one of these stupid things that keeps happening, is, is that there's tended to be a struggle for resources between people who are interested in child survival and child development. And so the way this is played out is by putting articles in the Lancet, because the Lancet is read by international agencies, and they'll go with the latest article. So about seven or eight years ago, a series on child survival went into the Lancet. And that you know, put paid to all of the work on early child development until the ECD folks got together under Pat Engel and those people, and they got their series in. But I'm here to tell you that if you actually look now at the infant mortality patterns around the world, there are only two countries in the world where less than 80% of the kids survive to school age. Chad and one other place. I can't remember what the other place was. But there are only two places. That infant mortality is becoming a smaller and smaller issue around the world. So much so that 12% of all of the infant mortality in the world these days occurs in one province of India, that being Uttar Pradesh. So, the point is, is that in a world where 80 to 100 percent of kids reach school age, the issue of development is everybody's issue. And so when groups like UNICEF go out and start doing surveys inside of households around the world, like the MIX survey, which this data comes from, and start to show that socioeconomic gradients in opportunities for children to develop are emerging in households around the world the same way they are in the wealthy countries, then that starts to matter. And this graph simply looks, for instance, at children in the richest versus poorest households in 43 countries that were surveyed by Mix in terms of uh, whether or not they have three or more children's books in the, in, the, in the household. And for those of you who can't read this, if you look at the light blue to the dark blue, the light blue is the richest 20% uh, and the dark blue is the poorest 20%. So you can see that all countries except for perhaps the Ukraine seem to have a gradient in relation to this. Similarly, you know, if we look at, for instance, access to early childhood education programs, all you have to do, once again, is squint at the dark versus the uh, light blue bars. And once again, you see the differences that exist there. And so one could pose the question, does the following represent a rights violation under the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child according to the rights and early childhood provisions that have been created under general comment number seven? And so if we go to my favorite tool, the one that made MAPS famous, the Early Development Instrument. Uh, it is a tool that kindergarten teachers fill out that looks at children's development according to their physical, social, emotional, language, and cognitive and communication skills while in senior kindergarten. And as many of you know, we've mapped this out across Canada, neighborhood by neighborhood, looking at the proportion of kids who are vulnerable or behind where we'd like them to be on the tool. So here is the southwest part of British Columbia, an area with about 3 million people in it, divided into about 250 neighborhood or hamlet areas, showing the fraction of kindergarten children who are behind where we'd like them to be on one or more of those scales in kindergarten. Now, as you can see, the range goes from the green to the uh, reddish brown, from a low of less than 5% to a high of over 60%. So a 12 to 15 fold plus variation level from the highs to the lows uh, in BC and for that matter in southern Ontario here as well. And we have data now for 80% of the country. So we're talking about a wealthy country where about 3 or 4% of kids are born with a biological limitation in their development and neighborhood differences that might be two to three fold at that point. By uh, kindergarten age, about 28 to 30% of the kids vulnerable and the neighborhood differences being 10, 15 plus fold. Right? Uh, moreover, whether or not you look at Canada, Australia, a place like Kosovo, or for that matter, a place like Mexico, there is our friend the socioeconomic gradient in relation to this multi-attribute index, right? So my argument would be that based on the notion of states' duty, duties uh, to provide for the opportunities for children's capacities to evolve, 
given that we know that most of these variations are, are avoidable, that this represents, in effect, a rights violation. That we are, it is evidence, both on the input side, according to those things about the books I showed you for an access to early child care, and on the output side, in terms of children's development, that we are not providing opportunities for children's capacities to evolve in an equitable way. Uh, another one, which is, I think, even more straightforward, is whether or not the following represents a rights violation under UNCRC General Comment 13. And 13 is the protection one, the one about protecting kids from violence, abuse, neglect, etc. And so going back to the mixed surveys, we see that in all of these countries, all of which are signatory to the Convention on the Rights of the Child, that if you look at the uh, length of the bar that is in dark blue, that is a proportion of children to age two to four who experience violent discipline within the past month. So we're talking about anywhere from 95% to 45%, all in countries that have signed the convention where uh, Article, is it 43, 42 or 43, is very explicit about this, right? So clearly, we're dealing here in both of these cases, where the answer to the question is yes, right? And that raises some interesting things and some interesting possibilities of linking child development and child rights together. Now, as you know, I'm an indicator freak. And so the question is, why indicators? Why monitoring? And not being, I'm not a legal scholar by any stretch of the imagination, but I have learned a few things as I've been going along. I've learned, for instance, the distinction between procedural rights and substantive rights. So a procedural right would be something like, you know, the right, for instance, for a child to be present when their parents are going through a separation or a divorce here, right? So it is something that, in effect, can be mandated today and it can occur tomorrow, right? So it is, it is something that is subject, in a sense, to immediate response. Whereas substantive rights are about things like economic, social, cultural rights that are much, much more embedded in society and can only be realized gradually over time. Right? So whereas it is reasonable to say, you know, if you're a 12-year-old kid, you have the right to be there when your parents are fighting over your future tomorrow, saying that children have a right to equal access to the opportunities to develop during the early years is one clearly that will have to unfold over time, right? And so if we're talking, and in the international doctrine, the notion is of progressive realization of substantive rights, how do we know if we, those rights are being progressively realized? Well, really, the answer is you can only tell if there's progressive realization by monitoring in some consistent way over time. And in that way, monitoring potentially has the capacity to bridge between population health and human rights. And so those of you who are aware, there is, for the uh, Convention on the Rights of the Child, a formal monitoring process that, in fact, all of the countries that have ratified the convention are, in principle, meant to toddle off to Geneva once every five years and report on their progress of what they're doing there. And so there's a, a loop here about submission reports and going through pre-sessions and issues being identified by the monitoring group in Geneva and the countries responding and there being what's supposed to be a constructive dialogue and then there being concluding observations written by the committee which is supposed to be the basis on which the country is supposed to pull up its socks for the next five years. And if you talk to the members of the committee, you discover that of the 193 countries that have signed the treaty, 159 are recipients of international aid. And their receiving of aid depends on this process working. And then there's another 30 some odd countries like Canada that are donors. And those are the countries they have the most trouble with because there's no stick, right? So that's why Canada drives them crazy. Um, but it is interesting to think that for many countries then, this is substantial because the continued receipt of aid from UNICEF and other agencies does depend on participating conscientiously in this process. So, but there's some existing problems with it. One, the reports quite often are not adequately evidence-based. And so it's very much like, yes, minister. Uh, for those of you who remember that, you know, when the minister started demanding you know, to actually see what was going on in the ministry, the uh, Sir Humphrey started sending him home with these big, you know, steel 
cases full of documents, and the irrelevant one would be way down at the bottom. So they have to spend all night hunting for it. And you know, you can see that countries send in these 500 pages reports, and it's very difficult to find what's relevant in them. So much so now that they're trying to limit the size. And because of that, you know, the country, they get behind on the monitoring. So quite often, the five-year process doesn't happen, and it goes to 10 years. And um, quite often, the concluding observations end up getting shelved and not used as an active resource. So there are a number of problems with it, even though, in theory, it's a pretty interesting system for monitoring. Now, I'd like to double back, because my interest here is particularly in turning general comment number 7 and general comment number 13 into things that we can monitor in a more consistent way. And so back in 89, the convention was promulgated. In 2002, they had a day of general discussion where this notion of coming up with a rider on implementing rights in early childhood came up at that point. And then uh, by 2005, in the context of the WHO Commission on the Social Determinants of Health, a group of us from our knowledge network on early child development got together with activists who'd actually written General Comment Number 7. And we went on, in December of 2005 to the monitoring committee when they were in session and said, we want you to ask us to produce a user-friendly and useful set of GC7 indicators, because we think we can make this thing work in a more real way. And lo and behold, a month later, we received such a letter. So that allowed us to get going on trying to create a set of indicators for uh, rights in early childhood. Now, the group as it stood to begin with involved Human Early Learning Partnership as the secretariat, uh, one or two people from the UN CRC committee itself, people from UNICEF, people from WHO, people from the International Children's Center in, um, in Ankara, which is very rights-oriented, people from what's called the Consultative Group on Early Childhood Care and Development, which is a sort of an international uh, talk shop where people who work on early child development get together, and then a few other groups like the Bernard Van Leer Foundation and the Aga Khan Foundation were part of this group. So that's the group that originally went and got the mandate. And what we discovered right off the bat was that if we were going to operationalize GC7, we had to bring two cultures together. One culture was the child rights culture. The child rights culture cares a great deal about motivation, about why people do what they do. Are people doing the right kind of things for the right kind of reasons? On the other hand, the public health culture, in a sense, was much more, quote, outcome oriented. So we were the ones who were saying, you know, we care about whether or not kids are getting those opportunities to be able to develop according to physical, social, emotional, language, and cognitive development kind of things. And we talked about environments of stimulation, support, and nurturance. But then the child rights people came back and said, fine, stimulation, support, and nurturance. But children are not passive. They are participating as well. Children are acting on their environments. And you have to take that into account as well. And it was at that point I realized how, in a sense, authoritarian the social determinants model was in a certain way. There's a certain kind of an environmentalism which basically you know, only defines the child in a passive role. right? And so we started to talk in this different way. And so we had to convince the child rights people that the outcomes mattered. And they were in the process of convincing us that commitment mattered, as well as activity, as well as outcome. And so in the end, you know, we managed to merge this. But it was like two years of uh, you know, epistemological struggle, in effect, where we spent a lot of time talking past each other. And so by May of 2008, we had created a set of indicators, uh, each of which was anchored in GC7, but linked back to the main convention, because people signed up to the countries sign up to the main convention. So if you can't see you know, the footprint of the thing in the main convention, you can't claim that countries are responsible for it. We did it by then. And then um, the committee turned around and invited us then to start piloting it. And while we were piloting it, GC13 was proposed and was written. Right? So that came along later while we were working on the GC7 stuff. So um, basically, what ended up happening was that each indicator 
within GC7 has three parts to it. It has questions on structure, which has got to do with whether or not there are laws, policies in place uh, in relation to something. Process, are there programs, are there budgets, et cetera, et cetera. And then outcomes, right? And the, this is the outcomes exist at two levels. One level is, is anybody measuring anything that would allow you to tell whether or not the outcomes that the particular structure and process are designed for are moving in the right direction or not? Uh, or first, are, you know, are they measuring anything? And secondly, is it going in the direction we want it to be going? So basically, that's what we're, we're looking at here, right? So to give you an example then, uh, one that comes from at the cusp between uh, GC7 and GC13, we would have, say, a structural question of the variety of, are there measures in place to ensure adequate data collection to monitor the progress made on the implementation of the right of young children to freedom from violence? Uh, process, are there initiatives to raise awareness and prevent violent physical and emotional disciplinary measures on children? And finally, has there been a reduction in the last five years, in other words, during a monitoring period, in the number of occurrence of all forms of violence perpetrated against children? So those would be kind of like some of the questions. And the way it would work is, for each of these things, a country would have to answer yes, no, or partially. So if you answer yes, you have to provide the documentation. If you answer partially, you have to explain why it's partially. And if you answer no, then what happens is the thing takes you through to uh, steps that you could take to uh, uh, achieve this thing, including right through to suggestions of programs. And by and large, what we've tried to do in this is put in programs that come from developing countries. Now, in this case, the example we've got here is the nobody's perfect. So that's not a developing country example. But that's what we're trying to do with this. So that was basically the idea. And the indicator clusters then have to match up with the reporting clusters that the convention recognizes. This is a little awkward for us because some of the reporting clusters don't fit the way we think. But nonetheless, they have one cluster which is called definition of the child. And in that, that's where we bring in the definition of the domains of children's development that we care about. General members of implementation. Is anybody doing anything with GC7 in the country? Is there a positive agenda? Is there human rights training? Is there evidence to create data collection systems around it? Children's rights and freedoms is the third cluster. So birth registration is the main issue there. The family environment and alternative care, there's a number of things there. Then uh, basic health and welfare. Uh, education, leisure, and cultural activities. And this is where things like access to quality early childhood education programs come in, as well as, for instance, things like the right to play come in there. Um, and then special protection measures for uh, 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 vulnerable group, especially vulnerable groups. So those are basically the sort of indicator clusters that we had to construct the questions around structure, process, and outcome. And then we got involved with pilot testing. So the first pilot we did was in Tanzania. Why Tanzania? Well, we wanted to do a pilot in a poor country, a middle-income country, and a rich country. And so Tanzania was our poor country. Um, it was easy for us to get into because there was a lot of rights work going on there, and they passed some new laws in this area. So they were very anxious to be seen to be collaborating. Our original pilot, basically, was meant to be a kind of a feasibility thing. Because here what we've done is we've taken these indicator, these reporting areas, we've come up with indicators that can be anchored back in the treaty. And they break down, when you break them down into all of the structure, process, and outcome questions, we have about 160 questions there. So the question is, what do you do when you lay this on a country? You know, will they be able to respond to it? So first question was, could an intersectoral team be created? Right? Could you get people from the various different ministries that were responsible to actually work together? And in Tanzania, in the end, the answer was yes, that we had a team of 24 people came together from six different ministries and about half a dozen related NGOs that actually worked together. Uh, were the items feasible to answer? Once again, the answer to that was generally yes. And what, what, what we found was is that when the the answer was whether or not they could answer the questions is yes. But if their answer to the question was probably going to be no, 
that's when the trouble started. And what would happen is the countries would go, you know, shuffling around looking for material that was vaguely related. So that's when we discovered we had to add a partially answer into the, into the thing because people would have policy programs that would semi-address the questions but not really address them. So we learned that as we were going through this. How long would it take? Well, it turned out that if you impaneled groups like this and you gave them about three months to work, during which time they worked very part-time on it, that each person on the panel, each of these, pa uh, you know, would, would give it maybe a cumulative one week of time. So as you can imagine, you've got 24 people all giving about one week of time spread out over three or four months. You could get the thing done, right? And would documentation be forthcoming? Well, in fact, in Tanzania, they managed to produce 160 documentary sources to validate the, the things that they were, they were saying to us. So we came out of the Tanzania pilot convinced that the thing was doable. But one of the things we realized was that we really needed to electronize the system, right? And so when we went back for the, um, the next pilot, um, we went to Chile. And Chile involved A, having to update all of the indicators based on questions that were ambiguous, B, creating a Spanish version, and C, creating an electronic version for it, right? Now, Chile is a middle-income country, right? And uh, at the time we were doing this, um, uh, the, there had been a change of government. But this had been after six years of Michelle Bachelet being the president of the country. So it's one of the few countries in the world that's ever had a developmental pediatrician as a president. And during her era there, they passed no less than 11 pieces of legislation to support uh, children with young families. So a really, really interesting thing that puts countries like Canada that are three times as rich as Chile to shame. Nonetheless, despite the fact that it shifted over to the uh, right-wing government, they preserved most of these programs. And they collaborated with us on this. So we went in there, one, to examine the usefulness of the indicators in conducting a thorough inventory for the country. So the first pilot was to figure out whether you could do it. This pilot was to do it, right? So the idea was we were going to get the whole of every document, get the whole thing appended so that it could go right through to a report writing stage, right? to explore the reaction of key stakeholders to the indicator framework in, in a revised form, to identify facilitators or barriers to the use of the indicators, and to attest the efficiency of the e-version of the tool. So here, despite the fact that we're talking about a country which has a much more elaborative, stru uh, elaborated structure than the others, it took about the same amount of time and effort. We managed to put together intersectoral teams, although interestingly in Chile, it was much harder to get civil society partners to collaborate with the government partners. It wasn't because of the civil society people, but under the current regime in Chile, the civil society partners are viewed with suspicion. So this was mostly a government e effort this time. So in that sense, it was less good than what went on in, uh, in Tanzania. But the amount of time it took to do it was about the same. Um, now just to give you an idea of some of the things that happened. Uh, the total number of documentary sources that were submitted in support of the policies, programs, and outcomes were as follows. So we ended up with 95 uh, uh, policy or structural uh, sources, 131 program uh, sources, and 55 outcome sources right, uh, submitted. And they came from a wide variety of places. Ministry of Education, Ministry of Health, Ministry of Planning, something called Integra. Junji, which is the uh, child care system, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, documentary sources coming from a wide range of places. And the groups who are working together on each of the indicators formed themselves into intersectoral teams. And they continued on to work intersectorally. So the process actually worked to create intersectoral collaborations. What we've got into now, though, is creating what we call heat maps. Now, it's a very weird name to use heat maps. Uh, this comes from the other end of my work. When, when you do like work on epigenetic marks and looking at whether or not epi the epigenome is turning genes on or off, you produce heat maps showing how much things are expressed. So basically, here, when we went into this with our set of indicators, what you can see is, is that there are, down this side, the indicator sets indicated there and then the structure, process, and outcome. And you can see the number of questions that exist against structure, process, and outcome varies by indicator, right? And that's why 
there's a lot of gray here, but some of these things have lots of boxes and some of them don't. So each of those boxes then represents the answer to a single question, right? And so if the answer is yes, the box is green. If the answer is yellow, the answer is partial. And if the box is red, the answer is no, right? So right off the bat, you can take the information from three months of collecting and documenting, et cetera, et cetera, and reduce it to something like that. The way the system is now set up, of course, is that we can point and click. So if you want to know why is that red, you can point and click on that. And up comes the question, and it shows you. right? And for the green thing here, you point and click, and you get their description of their answer and the documentation. right? So in effect, you can summarize 280 documentary sources in one heat map and go down and only look at the things you want to. And then as you can imagine, if we can keep this thing stable over time and you go back five years later, the question is, is the thing more green or more yellow or more red? So you know, once again, it's like the maps, right? You want everything to go green, right? So we've created this system that way. And um, this created a very interesting discussion there because there are certain clusters you can see here where the country's not doing so hot, right? And what that did is it focused you in on the fact that children in Chile are by and large seen and not heard. So that's got to do with participation and discipline kinds of things, right? So it, 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 it focused very quickly on some of what the main issues are for the country. And so in the end, the benefits are in creating a positive change of uh, agenda for child rights as a cross-cutting issue has got to do with how many no's and how many partials and yeses in the system. The capacity building is how to turn no's to yeses. And the better reporting system is, uh, is using these things to uh, portray things in ways that are commensurable and in ways in which the civil society partners and the people who don't trust the government reporting can see exactly what it is governments are saying and why it is they're saying it. So we've now done the poor country pilot, the middle income country pilot. The problem is finding a rich country, right? So we thought of one called Canada. And we have done a number of presentations, and indeed a number of provinces have expressed some interest. But we've had difficulty kind of getting over the top, right? It looks as though uh, Northwest Territories might come on as a regional pilot, which is an interesting one. But um, you can imagine, given the political climate nationally here, that it's not easy, even when you get expressions of interest at the political level or at the provincial level in some provinces or at some of the agency level, being able to kind of get ourselves over the top for this. We don't care, though. We're carrying on. And we're moving on to something called Global Child, which is meant to be a comprehensive child rights monitoring platform. So the first step of building that is to put General Comment 7 and 13 together. So we've done that. What we've done is we've taken um, indicator 7 in general comment number 7, which is about uh, violence and discipline, and pulled out our original questions from there and gone to general comment number 13 and created a, a much expanded set of questions based on general comment number 13. And we've done this in collaboration with the International Institute for Child Rights and Development in Victoria and others such as, uh, such as Sue uh, Bennett, who are here. So in a sense, it's like a a T like this, right? So this is if this is the uh, GC7 going down this way, this is the GC13 as it applies to children 0 to 8 going off this direction. And we're now negotiating with Columbia to do uh, a pilot there, which would pilot both at the national level but also at a municipal level. So we can see whether or not we can get credible information going from the bottom up and from the top down. So can the tool not only work as a national policy discussion tool, but also as a community development tool as well? And so yeah, uh, the rights of child to be uh, free from all forms of violence comes up in uh, Article 19 of the Convention, uh, which gave rise to general comment number 13. And once again, we've produced the structure process outcome uh, expansion of that. And the group now that we're working with now involves a secretariat that is a combination of the International Institute of Child Rights and Development and HELP, which is convenient that we are one uh, ferry ride away from each other, one in Vancouver, one in Victoria. Bunch of UN agencies, Plan International, bunch of academics, et cetera, African Child Policy Forums here, et cetera. So we have an expanded group, and we have a new renewed letter of concurrence from the Committee on the Rights of the Child to keep on keeping on here. And so basically the idea is this, right? You have here a tree, which could be thought of as being the, you know, the fulfillment of the convention, which has roots, 
uh, based on eight kind of reporting clusters there, right? So for instance, those reporting clusters involve things like basic health and welfare and special protection measures, right? So far, what we've done is we've fertilized this with the GC7, which relates to age 0 to 8. Um, we've created a skeleton of indicators um, that have structure, process, and outcome associated with that, which are being fertilized now with other, this metaphor will go on until I drop dead here, um, <laughs> with things like general comment number 13, which is the protection against violence one. And then the idea is to build it up one thing at a time so that ultimately we have a system that covers the full age range, 0 to 18, and all of the general comments uh, as well, and the optional protocols, in which case, ah, the sun comes out, right? And then we have, in effect, a way internationally to monitor the whole thing in an efficient way. And these days, they're saying they don't want any more than 40 pages per country. Well, you can imagine, if what we can do is we can get this system, computer-based system, down so you can answer it all, it can produce your heat map, and you can dig down inside of it, then it's going to be efficient. It's going to be efficient for the committee to be able to work, and it's also going to serve as an efficient tool for um, research. Right? And so we applied for a CFI grant, which we'll hear about next week, I guess, uh, to set up the system in all seven of the official reporting languages. We've got, you know, the basics already set up, but we've got some really good computer engineers and stuff ready to go. So we're hoping what we're going to be able to do is create a system that will allow, uh, you know, not only uh, to facilitate the monitoring of the whole convention this way, but also to f uh, create an opportunity for some very, very good research to be done as well. And with that, I'll stop talking. Thanks for listening. Yeah, what kind of challenges are we running into working with the Canadian federal government? Well, basically this is the way it goes. We meet with key mid-level and senior bureaucrats in key ministries that are responsible for this work. They express enthusiasm. They then fret about how they're going to sell it to the elected politicians, and then we don't hear from them for a while. We wait. We phone them back. They express enthusiasm. Then they express concern about how they're going to relate to the elected politicians. So we wait. And then we call them back. That's what's happening, basically. Right? And beyond that, I can't be more specific than that. People's, people's jobs are on the line in relation to this sort of thing. Now, having said that, Canada just reported a few weeks ago right, and was lambasted by the committee for not making progress in a number of areas. Canada is not making progress. right? Uh, you know, we, many of us know that, but you know, they know it too, right? So following that, there were some of the people who were actually part of the Canadian reporting group have expressed more interest in getting involved with this now, partly as a way, I think, to say, you know, look, Canada is trying. So we'll see. It's as full an answer as I can give you. Sir, yes. Well, the first thing is this, that most, of, most Canadians assume that Canada must be good at this, because we're good at so many things, relatively speaking. But those of us who are in the field know we're not. And it is very interesting when you go to countries, Tanzania, Chile, Peru, Colombia, all sorts of countries with income levels from one third to one thirtieth of us, and see that within their more limited resources, how much more seriously they are taking this. The second thing is, is that in a certain way, countries that historically have had weaker institutions have an advantage in an era of caring about child and human development. Because when you have weaker institutions, it's easier to start legislating and implementing intersectoralism. Whereas in our society, the institutions are very, very embedded, and so it's harder to do that. So that's been stuff that I think has been, has been, um, has been very interesting to see. 
Um, the other side, you know, another example is, and I suppose this is one of the things that I think is, is the most interesting example, is Kenya, for instance, introduced universal free primary education for the first time in order to be in compliance with the rights of the child, Convention on the Rights of the Child, which is very interesting to see, you know, to see countries, you know, th you know that they are using their, their uh, making their investment decisions that way. So I think in a certain way that those things have been surprising. Um, the other thing, too, is, is that when we first started doing this, part of the reason that we did this original feasibility pilot in Tanzania is because I thought that this was unreal. I mean, we've done all the work on it, but you know, I'm an academic. I'm used to the idea you work on stuff that isn't real. Um, but when we got there, it turned out that it worked, you know, that you could promote conversations and you could get people thinking about things in ways that they hadn't thought about before, right? And that even though there's lots of cultural specificity around the world, there's also lots of universality. And it isn't actually all that hard to get people to think this way about stuff. Yes? Yeah. Well, to, to attack every article and every general comment which has um, some progressive element to it, something that you know can change over time in a way, uh, yeah, that subject of progressive realization. Yeah, that's the idea. Yeah, sir. Yes. Yes, yes. And the intensive outcome of general comment six three one. Yes. So and then they kind of like factored into the participation. How do you show the participation of the young people? So that they're not just object of interest. Yes, yes. But subject of the participation of the young people. Yes, yeah. How is that evolved for you? How have you done that? Oh, that's a very good question. I mean first thing is, just as an example. When we first started doing the GC7 stuff, and this came up from uh, Alan Kukuchi White and uh, Lothar Krackman and people like that, um, we looked at the original UNICEF indicators that they were doing on participation, right? And their participation indicator was age 12 to 17, literally. That, you know, and not 0 to 12, right? So, so it was sort of like, what? You know, a crying baby is not participating in the decisions that affect them? So, you know, immediately we brought in, for instance, that whole period of purple crying, shaken baby thing, right, as being part of violating children's right to participate, right? The problem that we get into, though, is trying to bring kids' voices into this. You can, in fact, if you do a town hall meeting right, you can get kids as young as four and five to actually speak up and say things. And, in fact, they did that in Jamaica. But in terms of trying to create you know, structured input this way, it's much harder. Now, what we've been doing in BC is we've gone on from the early development instrument to what we call the middle years development instrument, which is done at age 10 in grade 4. And there, the teachers read out the questions, but the kids fill them in themselves. So we've now got population-based maps, according to my obsession, that shows what kids are saying, both about their well-being and also about their assets that they see themselves having in five different classes of assets, right? So that goes directly at this, right? This is directly at the kids saying whether or not the schools, the neighborhoods, the parents, et cetera, et cetera, are providing environments of support for them, right? So from age about 10 onward, I know we can do it because we've done it, right? Below that, it's trickier in that respect. But, you know, even saying that by definition, indicators of participation have to start at age zero is a very important point of propaganda, you know? Yes. Yes. 
Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, very astute point. First off, right, as far as one could go with something like this is to say whether or not an outcome which is meant to be moved by a given structure or a process is going in the direction you want it to go, period. But trying to make causal inferences at this level is a mugs game, right? Having said that, it will be interesting over time if as you know, structures and processes in relation to a given outcome go up, if the indicator goes in the wrong direction. Right? So the, if it goes in the wrong direction, the information is quite unambiguous that way. But at the moment, it's a question of juxtaposition. Right? And the key thing that we've noticed is that as a general rule, although there is a lot of stuff about structure and process, there isn't much stuff about outcome to begin with. So a lot of what this is going to do is going to structure for countries the kind of data collection systems they need to have and the things that they need to be drawing on. Right? And you have both the question of countries creating the systems and also the question of whether or not they're using the data that already exists. Right? Because quite often, you know, there are forms of data that do exist, but countries aren't looking at it or haven't organized it right. So I think we're largely in that, in that period. Right? But you know, it, it certainly is a mistake to try to claim that if you know, the indicator is going in the right direction and you're doing x, that x caused it. And there's no question about that. Um, I'd like to get to the point where that's the primary problem, but we're not there yet. Yeah. We at the back, yes. Yeah, excellent question. Uh, just, just to mention, too, that Tara is actually part of our CFI. So if we get that through, she's going to be working with us on that. Um, I, you know, uh, this is going to sound like a really strange answer. But people have a tendency not to argue with me very much. You know, it's sort of like, yeah. So I very rarely hear the, you know, the other side. Where I hear it from more, to be honest with you, is because I come out of the population and public health world. There is a tendency for people in that world to go, right? You know, that's just, that's just hot air. You know? That's just lawyers, you know, full employment programs for lawyers and stuff like that. So in that world, right, the issue of the kind of thing that you know, uh, Stefania and, and Brent just published, starting to show that people's reporting of their fulfillment of rights actually does look as though it's a determinant of health, starts to become very important. For people like that, the idea that rights are in, I inherently valuable in and of themselves isn't even worth making, right? Because they don't care about that. Uh, but the more that there is evidence that addresses directly the question of whether or not the fulfillment of rights, not just the signing of the treaties, which means nothing, but the actual fulfillment of rights actually supports health and well-being and development in society, the better it'll be in terms of all of these, all of those kind of objections, right? Because, you know, in this country as it stands right now, I mean, I think if one got inside the head of most of the people in the ruling party, they, you know, they couldn't give a toss one way or another about, you know, whether or not children's rights were being fulfilled on their own terms. But if they believed that by fulfilling those rights, the vulnerability rates on the EDI would go down and that you would get the returns to the economy, that our modeling suggests you would, they would care about that. And the Business Council on National Issues cares about that, and the Conference Board cares about that, and the Chamber of Commerce cares about that, and therefore, Harper would care about it sooner or later too, I think. So that's what I would say. Yes? Yeah. 
Yes. In terms of the right to play, there is a whole bunch of work being done on that these days. You know, there's being sort of general comment being generated on right to play. Uh, uh, you know, and there's a lot of activism going on around that. Um, it's interesting with the, the rights of indigenous people. Um, I'm not thinking so much about this last uh, committee meeting, but the previous one back in, um, or the meeting back in uh, January or February of 2012, uh, the group that went from Canada was dominated by Aboriginal people, right, from Canada. And it seemed, I met with a number of the committee members afterwards, and it seemed to create a form of tension in that they came away with the idea that what Canada was saying is that it's only Aboriginal kids who need the convention, that none of the rest of the kids do, right? And, you know, the convention is very universalistic. It is meant to be there for all of the kids, right? So when Canada does things like that and, you know, highlights the Aboriginal kids only, um, it, 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 plays, it plays in a very funny kind of ambivalent way. And I was actually a bit surprised by what I heard there. Um, now, you know, having said that, I mean, it is pretty obvious that the rights issues as they apply among Aboriginal kids are huge, right? And, I mean, one of the things that's starting to emerge now, you know, in the other side is the way in which you get intergenerational transmission of uh, deprivation one way or another. So, for instance, you know, it's starting to become clear that, th for instance, things like epigenetic mechanisms can, in fact, transmit intergenerationally a bit. So the question of whether or not, you know, in the context of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, you know, whether or not you can talk about second and third and fourth and fifth generation effects of residential school, I think is a very particular issue. Um, whether or not that's going to play out at the convention level, I don't know. I have to say for myself, the fact that we're probably going to do our Canadian pilot in the Northwest Territories is very fortuitous in terms of this, because we're going to get a chance to dig, to dig way into it, right? And we'll see. We'll see what comes of it. Yeah. Yes? Yeah. Okay. Well, in terms of your first question, the only part I can answer to it directly is that if you take a bunch of people who are part of statutory agencies and are already being paid, and you put them together in these committees that meet and you send them off, you know, to collect up the documentation from their particular ministries and bring it back and discuss with others. So you're giving a month of, t uh, a week of work over about three or four months of people who are already have a day job and that you're building it into the day job. The marginal cost is not very great, actually. So it's actually not been very onerous at all, right? And in both Tanzania and Chile, it went off without a hitch, really. You know, in Chile, we, in Tanzania, we did provide small honoraria. In Chile, we provided, you know, a certificate. And that was enough, right? Because part of it is, is it's sort of like, it's like you could argue that they should be doing this anyway, right? So, so, so there's that side. In terms of, you know, the idea that the, some of those southern tier countries are more child friendly and that they're the ones that are getting really plugged at this point. There is some truth to that, but at the same time, some of the countries that are doing just fine, i.e. the Nordic countries, they're very child-friendly too in different ways, right? So, you know, I don't know, I'm not quite sure how that's going to cut, right? I mean, the only other factum I can give you with that is that when you look across Canada, I remember when we were working on the NLSCY data years ago, it did seem that the parts of the country like the Maritimes that used to work on seasonal employment and unemployment, that if you were in a community, a child growing up in a community where your parents were seasonally unemployed, but all the parents were seasonally unemployed, that it might actually benefit you because your parents are around more. 
But I'm, I doubt that that's true in Greece or Spain or Portugal these days where you know, people have lost their livelihoods. I, you know, it's, it's impossible to imagine that. And having said all of that, I've forgotten your second question, which I do know I have an answer to. So what was the second question? Oh, Asia, yeah, good question. We've had expressions of interest on this work from Thailand and from, um, and from Shanghai, the municipality of Shanghai. Um, both cases, it's interesting because the expressions of interest have come from uh, people and agencies that seem to have a pretty authoritarian cast. And so it's going to be interesting to see what happens when the rubber hits the road with the, with the questions, right, and with the work on it, right? Um, I don't know what's going to happen yet. You know, and we were, we're working away at this kind of one country at a time. To be honest with you, the countries that are far and away the most enthusiastic about getting involved are in Latin America. That's where we're getting the big uptake, you know, Colombia, Peru, Chile, places like that. have the last question. Uh, as you were talking, I was looking around and there's quite a few students here who are being trained and uh, hopefully they'll finish and they look for jobs and I'm really hoping that they will look for jobs in a field that relates to children and advocacy or policy or research or any of these fields. As you were talking, like w your work really uh, mirrors, I would call it evidence-based advocacy. That's the best way I can describe it. What are the skills you think people might need in order to do a similar type of advocacy work or promotion work? Now that we're moving into a, kind of bringing these different frameworks together, like the social determinants with the human rights frameworks, the public health, what would be your guess? Because <laughs> uh, I probably you haven't thought about it much, but. Um, what would you think you would like in someone who works in this field to have in terms of skills? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, well, there's a number of things. I mean, one of the things is that it's pretty important to be comfortable in both a quantitative and a qualitative world and to not feel like you have to privilege one over the other. That's one thing that's clear to me. Second is that you have to be really interested in, I mean, most of the people who are going to go into this will have backgrounds in public health or psychology or things like that. And by and large, those people don't necessarily think that much about history and, politi and politics and sociology and so forth. But the fact is that a lot of the skills that go into this stuff really come out of those worlds, like understanding how you you know, recognize and work with institutions. To what degree can you, in a sense, monocrop institutions in different parts of the world, or do they have to be customized, et cetera, et cetera. That comes out of sociology. It comes out of those different kinds of things. So you have to be prepared to be quite broad in your disciplinary thinking, right? And I think that that's a, that's a key part to it. Um, you also have to be pretty non-elitist as well, right? You want to be prepared to learn at multiple levels, right? And so, you know, certainly, I mean, part of the thing that's great about the alliance that's been created recently between HELP and ICRED is that ICRED was doing community development and we were doing the stuff at the government level and then trying to force those two levels together and being prepared to do that, right? So, so that's pretty important, which means that you have to be prepared, in a sense, to fight the academic culture a little bit, at least so far as that goes. Um, yeah, so I mean, th yeah, I mean, that's, that's very schematic, but that's, yeah, I think that that's a lot of it, yeah. Thank you, Paul. That's yeah. great having you. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. yeah. Well, that was fun.